You're listening to the Jiu-Jitsu Lou podcast and I'm Lou Temlett. I'm guessing you're having a good day because either you've been on the mats, considering getting on the mats, or maybe taking yourself to train. I'm so happy you're here listening or watching this episode. Please don't tap out before the end. When you want to begin an endless journey, start training jujitsu. I'd like to welcome Adam Pulfer to my podcast. Hi, Adam. How are you? I'm very well, thanks, Lou. How are you? Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for joining me all the way from Finland. Um, I know you're kind of out there for the time being. Tell me a bit about your journey because we've connected on Instagram and you have mm-hmm. an account called Roll With It Jiu Jitsu. And I've seen a number of your videos and clips and beautiful photography um, on your platform. So tell me a bit more about your intentions with Roll With It Jiu Jitsu. Sure. Thanks very much for calling it beautiful photography, by the way. That's very kind. Um, I think uh, lots of uh, martial arts get photographed in exactly the same way, and I'm trying to show it in a slightly different way, I think, almost like a, a fly on the wall type thing. But, yeah, the, the role with it really came from – it was an idea I had about a year ago where I was trying to encourage friends to kind of who I've made in the jiu-jitsu world to talk about the mental health aspects of jiu-jitsu and – then uh, uh, another creative friend of mine suggested, well, why don't you make some like interview style short stories? And uh, and I really liked that idea. And then I came up with the idea of calling it Roll With It. Um, and, and then I kind of went from there to start emailing people and asking people in my home club if they'd be up for it. And it took me a long time to actually get it going. But once it did, uh, I, I kind of couldn't stop. So, yeah, oh. I'm, yeah, I'm uh, trying now. In fact, like you said, I'm in Finland, um, trying to get people here to do it too. That's the uh, yeah, difficult with the language barrier. I love the fact that you've gone kind of European wide. That the boundaries of jujitsu aren't just within our local space. You know, they very much traverse you know the the country the continent and the world and Mm -hmm. i'm sure like uh me you've met a number of individuals um who've trained all over the world competed all over the world certainly within our instagram lives and in real life tell me about your story and why you started training jujitsu well i was i was doing uh thai kickboxing about 10 years ago in my mid-20s um, and I really loved that. That was just uh, what I wanted to do at the time. All I wanted to do. I was training five, six times a week. And uh, I actually did one one jujitsu class and I didn't really enjoy it. It didn't resonate with me at the time. I was, I guess I was in a different headspace at the time. And then I, uh, I trained up for a couple of MMA fights. And both of those went my way, but with chokes rather than with striking. And so okay. something about training jiu-jitsu for MMA, doing the no-gi, I really enjoyed. And then um, dreaded COVID, sent everybody into lockdown. And yep. I, I, I always need a project. I need to be working on something or I just stagnate, I stop. Yeah. And uh, then when things started to open up again, I was like, well, maybe I'll try the gi. I'll go and just roll. First of all, I was sick of being punched in the head. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I hear yeah. that a lot on this uh, on this show. <laughs> it's like, no, I don't need to be hit in the head. I don't need to be struck or whatever it is in in kind of the MMA side of things. Yeah, and so I just I, I thought, well, jujitsu is the <laughs> the gentle art. <laughs> Maybe I'll try that, but I'm learning it's still pretty brutal at times. <laughs> and so yeah, yeah I, I signed up signed up for um, nearest gym that was doing gi classes and that's it that's all she wrote really i'm hooked like so many people are yes and do you still train no gi now i do actually weirdly enough here in the gym that i'm training at in finland they do one gi class a week and maybe two or three people attend and the rest is no wow. gi very uh wrestling based and brutal everyone is really really <laughs> tough here uh, I think they've all got thick Nordic blood, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a really small guy. I'm only like 58 kilos or something like that. So everyone is bigger than me, even 
back home here i'm wrestling with giants <laughs> oh my goodness and um, what is it about nogi i've still got to find my personal passion with nogi what is it that gives you so much kind of progress kind of mental health well-being and i know jiu-jitsu as a whole you know we will talk about the kind of mental health benefits but what for you is the draw for nogi well, I actually prefer the gi. Uh, I think I, I I go to the Thursday night class they do here. I'm there, you know, obnoxiously yeah. early every time, getting warmed up. And it's kind of the fact that there is only no gi classes really here is forcing me yeah. to get out of that comfort zone. And the, mm. I think basically when I started training in the gi, I thought from doing the MMA that I knew about jiu-jitsu and I very yeah. quickly learned that I knew nothing. I really, uh, really, really knew nothing. You know, I, I could, uh, you know, I knew what a rear naked choke was. I didn't yeah. understand the subtleties of it at all. And yeah. I think that was a, a level of kind of ego and arrogance at the time. And it very quickly humbles you. Yeah. And it's like a superpower. As soon as I started to learn the intricacies of the that ground game, and I'm, I have to learn this. I have to learn yeah. it. And I... Yeah, I, I do prefer the gi, but being here, it's pushed me out of that comfort zone again. And yep. and I'm I'm getting leg lock time and time again. <laughs> that sounds and, uh, familiar. I'm really enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure anyone that really enjoys a leg lock, but we'll we'll park that bit there. That's fine. The reason why I asked about no gi was from your kind of striking and MMA experience kind of being in that for 10 years or a longer period of time um my assumption incorrectly would be that you would enjoy that but i guess that transition to thinking that you know an art or having that opportunity you know for me in the gi it's like i've got no idea about no my no gi game um, mm -hmm. And just having that kind of switch. So it's almost, you know, it's it's that two games within the one art as well. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I don't think I really have, I don't know enough about it to say what it is that makes it resonate yeah. with people because it seems to be becoming the thing. I feel like the gi seems to be disappearing a bit for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the spectacle, I guess it simplifies things in a way you can watch it and understand it a bit more as an outsider. That's why it has yeah. so much outside viewing and, and also things like the UFC, yeah. you know, one of the biggest sporting, you know, uh, broadcasters in the world, Hoist Gracie won the first UFC with Jiu Jitsu and he was wearing a gi and then everyone was like, Oh, we, we need ground game because he was just beating everybody and no one knew how. Yeah. And then the spectator then had to learn it. I had to understand it because otherwise they couldn't follow the the events yeah. and then that's uh bled outwards into the nogi jiu-jitsu world and that's got loads of followers now that you know people broadcast polaris and stuff like that yeah. had i think record breaking viewers on their stream this year and uh, i think yeah as spectators it's easier to understand you know th watching someone hip throw somebody with a gi spectacular but then when it goes to the ground they can't yeah. really see the the collar grips and stuff like that it, you have to do it to know it i think i hadn't uh, kind of appreciated the gi game in that way that spectators do need to be able to understand what moves and kind of what what's going on um, you know, kind of grabbing the lapel and kind of feeding your hand round to the back of the collar and all of, like you say, all of the intricacies of a gi game. I, I will take that away with a, a mindful time to consider consider that a bit more. Yeah, but I think what, I, what I'm taking away from training predominantly no gi here is learning not to rely on those grips. You know, you have to learn... Have yeah. to hold on to limbs in a certain way and put your body in certain positions and apply pressure in a different way and yeah. so i think both offer techniques that can transfer across you know either way and i'm hoping that some of the things i learn here i can take back to my home gym back in bournemouth and i can you know maybe uh catch some people out that 
or maybe not expecting me to have uh, good leg locks in. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that. Um, you know, being able to, um, you know, experience training in different gyms and then coming back to where you usually train, you know, it can either highlight or it can definitely highlight your growth and progression or the gaps in your in your game. And I think yeah. either way from a, a kind of personal development in jiu-jitsu is a great thing mm -hmm. tell me more about the kind of mental health growth and progression for you and for maybe some of the people that you've interviewed in your once again beautiful videography um, kind of setups um, because that's a very key element to jiu-jitsu as well uh, it definitely is for myself and I think the more people I speak to the more I find that it's their it's their sanctuary you know the the working week or the weight of your bills or your problems they they dissipate when you step onto the mat because you can't bring them with you you know it's you have to be so focused on what you're doing and uh, I I received my blue belt about a year ago as I was saying to you just mm. before we started and I was I was going through I don't know. I, I'm one of those people. I'm definitely a, a glass is half full kind of person. But my partner and I were going through a difficult time, not with each other, but in a situation that we we're in. And I received my blue belt at the same time as all of this terrible stuff's going on outside the gym. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, I don't know, the expectation of stiff upper lip where I come from is yep. is quite prominent. And I just burst into tears when I received my blue bell because whenever I feel like I don't have any direction, jujitsu is giving me a direction. And, you know, I think I felt, I didn't feel ashamed that I was crying when Steve, my coach was giving me my blue bell. I was really proud of myself. And, yeah. and it reminded me that actually you can compartmentalize this stuff and you can yeah. learn how to deal with it in a different way. And, and this symbol of the blue bell was showing, you know, but, I'm getting stronger at this thing. And so this stuff that's wearing me down, yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It'll be in the past. And uh, I hear those story, that same kind of story more and more from the people I talk to, Yeah, you know, that they're, they're working through something and the, the mat is a safe place for them to kind of build that mental strength and realize that they're capable of so much more than they think they are. Yeah, I agree. We will come back to those stories in a moment. Mm -hmm. This is the Jiu-Jitsu Lee podcast with me, Lou Temlett, coming to you from the UK. Go and check out the latest video clips over on ju.jitsu.lu. And as you're listening or watching on your favourite podcast platform, I'd really appreciate you dropping the show a rating and a review. Today, I'm having a conversation with Adam Pulfer. Adam, let's get back to those stories and the support in terms of mental health. You very kindly shared your emotional journey and progress through receiving your blue belt. Um, and I think, you know, it's ultimately dedication and reward that you were able to be able to express your emotions in that space. And you say that it's a safe space. And I think all of us that train. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu agree that it's that kind of safe fighting express of emotion space but what's been the hardest part of your journey on the mats that's a really good question I de I definitely feel a bit of imposter syndrome having received the blue belt and I don't think that's unusual actually mm. and I kind of I remind myself that the integrity of my coach it is exactly that he 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 wouldn't have given it to me if I uh, if I hadn't earned it because yep. there's definitely a level of that in jujitsu too that mm. this they don't get handed out willy nilly like it yeah if you get it you did earn it and I have to remind myself that you know I belong here <laughs> yeah but um you know there are definitely days when I have really hard roles and there's people that I feel as though I should be able to technically beat that yep. just completely crushed me. And uh, I think letting go of that is a, a big part of the progression. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so th the hardest part for me is feeling as though I'm where I am. <laughs> yeah. 
I think I think I just saw that ego fly out the window there, Adam. <laughs> it just just <laughs> you sharing. <laughs> yeah. I, I grew up when I was really young, I played rugby. I come from a mm-hmm. rugby family. And uh my uncle was the youngest of four brothers, and he played uh professional r- under 18s rugby. And uh, my earliest memories are of him running me up and down the street, passing the ball to each other. And I'm four years old. Yeah. And going, it's your ball, it's your ball, it's your ball. And I know he was encouraging, he was trying to encourage me to be a competitor. And that definitely stuck with me. I'm definitely competitive. But reflecting on that as an adult, it's it could be a very dangerous, almost poisonous thing to be putting into a child that it's your ball, it's your ball. Yeah. And and um I had to unpack that as an adult and really think about that. And yeah, I, I've trying, like I said, jujitsu is the great humbler. And so in the yeah. last couple of years, I've basically been shown that you're not all that. But also you can learn things and you can become a role model for the people that do look up to you. And the, the journey, like you, you've said, you know, an endless journey at the start, yeah. knowing that I can never, number one, I'm never going to be the best because I'm too old. <laughs> so let go of that it doesn't matter it's not about being the best it's about just getting better and learning yes. more and, and yeah and, and knowing that i can never learn it all is really exciting for me <laughs> yes it's that next step and and just the the intricacies of each move and i think that's what i'm appreciating in my journey at the moment that you know um side control or kind of neo i i've re reignited my love for neon belly um mm-hmm. I had some feedback in a in a kind of rolling session the other lunchtime, and I, you know, I've kind of put that bit back in my game. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I've got to practice that a bit more. Um, but it's it, like you say, it's that those intricacies and learning new things, and it's it's endless. There will never be a point mm-hmm. where it's the perfect of everything. You know, mm-hmm. I know we have. Um, we all know some amazing competitors that it always seems like they have the perfect everything throughout all of it. But mm-hmm. there's an element of competition. And I will just highlight the age. Um, I am older than you, Adam. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I don't, you're not old. None of us are old. Um, I know we probably all want to be training jujitsu for the whole of our lives. But I think that competitive spirit and the expectation to be the best, we've kind of, it's a release of that ego to be, you know, I don't know. I I feel a bit controversial saying that, you know, being uh, and competing, I've got my first competition kind of coming Mm -hmm. up. Actually, the day that this episode drops, I will be in Barcelona. um, Cool. You have to match up this time. I do. And I've dropped a couple of age categories, which is fine. Um, Mm. And I feel like there's this kind of some development to do in the next couple of weeks, Mm. but that's fine. But the the best actually is only your own best in that moment Mm -hmm. and just giving everything or as much as you can that day. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think I, I learned, I, everybody says this, I learned so much more when I'm tapping and losing than I do when I'm winning in a way. You know, like I said, I won those two MMA fights with chokes. Yeah. And the second one, I trained really, really hard and it was all over in an instant. And I didn't feel like a winner afterwards. I just, uh, it was a very deflating moment. I was all this adrenaline dumped. Yeah. And I was like, this isn't it. It, it you know, it, it didn't feel like the top of a tower. I was just, Oh, I, I I caught him out with a with a choke, and that was it. It was over. And yeah. what I really loved actually was training and learning how yeah. to how to do a good rear naked choke. Um, I think you know focusing on rear naked chokes is a great thing. I have some uh, previous guests that are very good at it, um, mm-hmm. and um, yeah. Uh, as well as arm bars, of course. Um, that's yeah. always the thing. Uh, and that's still some of the things that the blue belts try. Um, I'm 
you know, now well within my white belt and I'm still trying to master the arm bars. It's getting the leg over the head and uh, before I roll backwards and, you know, pull on the arm bar. Anyway, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> what is your uh, – I, I was going into a space then. You could see that, Adam. <laughs> oh, I, I, you were pulling me into it too. I was ready to <laughs> chat about the, uh, yeah, the whole uh, – yeah, the whole shebang of position then submission, but oh yeah, go on. Let's. I was gonna just gonna ask you your favourite move. Maybe we all have have something, but <laughs> but or we can just talk about arm bars. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's hard to say. I love my bottom triangle game is quite good. Mm. I think uh, um, it was one of the first lessons that I had. One of the first techniques that we worked through that we were drilling when I went to uh, Paul BJJ where I first started training in the gi and something about that just worked for me but the problem with that being a little guy is it's quite easy to stack me or pick me up and so i have to have a really good bottom triangle game um, but I, I try to work three submissions you can get from that approximate triangle yeah and so if i can if i can get one arm in and one arm out usually i'm in a pretty good position because you can either work that arm bar the triangle yeah. or the omoplata depending on how they're defending um so having having three in the arsenal in one position is really good uh, i try not to get stuck on one <laughs> nice i like that from uh, i like that idea i i'm mm-hmm. gonna try and pull that into my game now so from one position having three submissions what's the uh, logic position and submissions you kind of highlighted a, you know some that's, kind of saying or something there yeah that's what uh I, I i don't know if he uh cornered the phrase but steve greenaway who was my coach for the year all the way up to blue belt i i moved around so i'm at a different different club now harbour rollers which is closer to where i was living in bournemouth but um yeah position then submission is really important i think it it, it looks great when you spin around straight into an arm bar and sometimes you'll get it but actually just applying pressure and and slowly working the position um, works better for most people. I don't know. I'm, I'm at a bit of a transitional phase at the moment where I find it really hard to put pressure on people. But being yeah. so small, when I'm rolling with more advanced guys, most people here are blue belt and above in the club that I'm training at. And so I can't catch them out and i find it really hard to keep my weight on them and so i'm trying to be more explosive and trying to work on timing yeah trying to allow that their body weight to kind of be their issue rather than mine so you know just wait wait for that moment where their momentum takes them the wrong way and, and exploit learning how to exploit that momentum and then being quick just being fast and so i'm trying to take that position submission but learning how to do it really really fast um, good. but yeah so yeah so like a rear naked choke getting that seat belt in first is so important if you just whack an arm under their chin you know you might be neglecting your hooks and then their hips out and and you've yeah. lost it and before you know it they've <laughs> they've got top position and you're like oh i thought i had them there so yeah really learning to control someone when you're in a dominant position and not getting uh yeah overexcited yeah and, and putting it in slowly is a uh, definitely a good good tip yeah. i would say yeah <laughs> but what I, do I, I know i'm a lowly blue belt <laughs> <laughs> no look we we all have progressed and learn all of these things throughout our game and what i've noticed along my journey you know the speed of everything just starts to slow down the more you progress through things but you know having that um, I'm I'm a dancer as well, so the musicality and having that explosive, some kind, sometimes you know something unexpected in that makes the game more interesting. And it sounds like you're at that point where you're starting to put the more interesting in that is unexpected and you know is working for you. Yeah, well, that I, I come from a bit of a musical background too, and timing is, I think, something that you can yeah. learn. You can feel like a rhythm of a person if you roll with them enough, and yeah. and being able to um, identify their their movements before they even know they're going to do them, you know, by yeah. picking up on the way they move, 
you can you can look for those gaps knowing they're going to be there in a in a moment you know the gap's not there yet yeah but it's going to be and yeah that's something that i'm trying to work on at the moment because yeah like i said the guys over here are big and strong and <laughs> really technically <laughs> able so and that's why this is an endless journey <laughs> exactly yeah you know i think um it's so fluid and it's yeah it's so nuanced that yeah, yeah. you you yeah there's so much to learn now mm. Okay, so your uh, Roll With It Jiu-Jitsu Instagram mm -hmm. account very much highlights other people's journey and stories. Mm -hmm. What have you found the most rewarding for you out of sharing other people's stories? Um, my hope, my real hope, is that the rewards will, become, uh, will come in the future and that maybe I'll get that message one day that someone says, I saw your video and it got me to go to a class and now I'm... I'm hooked and I go all the time. That's that's really my only goal. That's the mission statement is to try yeah. and show people that it, from the outside, it can look really savage. You know, when I talk to my parents about the fact that, well, first of all, I wanted to do a cage fight. They think it's mad. They, and and that's what they think of when I say I'm going to jujitsu or they see that I've got a big bruise on my arm or something where someone's, you know, put a big grip on my arm and they've bruised me. It just one bruise just brutal. one bruise <laughs> uh, I, i'm <laughs> many dalmatian actually but yeah it's um yeah, so from the outside it can look very very savage mm. and i'm trying to show that it's a really really welcoming place and yeah. it's a place where people can grow and like i said they can learn things they never thought they could do yeah and i see that all the time you know you get someone who's got a fresh bright white gear on and they come in and they look a little bit nervous and a few weeks down the line you know they're they're flowing and rolling and they're applying things that they've learned and i can see how much people grow from it that i just yeah. want to i want to share it with everybody yeah. and i i also understand the limitations of my uh social marketing skills so i um it, it i keep my goals small and I try yeah. to make things as big as I can. So if it reaches one person, mission accomplished. Yeah. Uh, my hope is that I can reach loads of people. Yeah. I think that's admirable to be able to, you know, share other people's stories and be part of, of their journey as well as your own. Um, mm -hmm. But actually the reward, you know, having just one person impacted by the work and the stories you share. Now I know uh, Will is one of your the people that you've spoken with. Uh, I'd love to have Will on to talk about his story and journey. Yeah. Um, but how were you impacted by filming and kind of creating his his kind of end video piece? I feel very lucky that he he was willing to share his story with me actually because I've in the same way i thought that i knew what jujitsu was and then i yeah. did it and then i realized i didn't know anything about it is I'd, I'd known will for about a year and i didn't i didn't know that he started rolling because his dad had passed and he he was looking for some kind of sense of community and he was feeling a bit lost and so from a selfish point of view i i got to learn something about somebody mm -hmm. who i already really liked who i love rolling with I, I wouldn't say I had any prejudices against him, but I certainly had an idea of who I thought Will was. And yeah. then I get I get to see the, another layer of somebody that I'm or that I already really get on with. And so I've I, I've interviewed people before, but interviewing people in the jujitsu world, I, I, I'm really passionate about the subject matter. Yeah. And so, uh, f f yeah, to to then get to do that with people who I really like and and learn a bit more about them it's yeah like i said lucky is how i feel it's it's just amazing you know all of the people that we meet on the mats you know have such a layered and compacted life you know before jiu-jitsu during jiu-jitsu and maybe after jiu-jitsu and you've kind of uncovered some of that layer of what goes into all of us to be on the mats in the first place. And I think, you know, it's uh, like you say, you're very lucky to be able to experience that 
but also you know it, it's it becomes a privilege as well and you know i look forward to seeing and watching more of your um you know the stories that you share because mm -hmm. you know we all have a, we all have a story um you know whether we share that or not so many elements of life we bring to the mats we hide on the mats because it's a safe space and then we go away and deal with life outside of that as well um but uh, as as we already shared you know this is an endless journey yeah what are you working on next adam well i'm trying to uh get some videos shot here while i'm in finland and I've, they'll have to be subtitled i think i i think we take for granted in the uk that we have such a global language and actually what i really love about the finnish language is some things don't translate to english there's there's yeah. you'd have to say a whole sentence to translate a single word sometimes mm -hmm. And so uh, I'll have to enlist the help of my partner um, to to subtitle the the videos that I'm hoping to shoot here. Um, but there's there's definitely a kind of warrior spirit in Finland, and that's something I'm hoping to capture here. And uh, Miro, who's one of the head coaches at uh, Dojo Helsinki, where I train here, um, he said he's up for it. So I'll, I'll, I'll at least get one done while I'm here. Fantastic. And it's very much a passion project of yours, but, mm -hmm. you know, just being able to share those, those journeys and stories. And, and uh, I'm intrigued to hear the warrior aspect in, in kind of, uh, I was going to say technicolor, but actually the beauty of your work <laughs> that it's black and white. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why I went for black and white. It's uh, snobbery. I don't know what it looks more uh arty to me <laughs> yeah it looks good we we can we can sign that off as a your creative you know uh, yeah. <laughs> signature that's fine um adam how can people get hold of you and follow your journeys journeys just uh, at roll with it jujitsu on instagram uh and then there's links to the youtube page so on instagram i just share short clips stories and then you can watch the the whole kind of uh long format ones on youtube from there um so yeah i kind of put little teasers on the on the instagram page roll with it jujitsu and then from there you can you can find everything else fantastic adam thank you so much for um coming to us from finland um i wish you absolute joy and wealth of mental health and positivity for your journey um and yeah just thank you so much for sharing the time really appreciate it well thank you and good luck with your first competition next week i'll be listening in and uh, rooting for you thank you i'd almost forgotten anyway good luck <laughs> me <laughs> thank you adam <laughs> thanks so much lou i hope you enjoyed this episode Thank you for telling your friends about this show. And as soon as this episode ends, I'd really appreciate you dropping the show a review. Thanks again for listening. Catch you on the next episode of the Jiu Jitsu Lou podcast.